All right, good deal. If you have a Bible, please turn to uh, Matthew chapter 19. If you don't have one, there should be one around you someplace. Uh, North Parker would love to help you find one, I think. Uh, Matthew chapter 19, we're going to look at uh, verses 3 to 6 will be some of the verses we're looking at this morning. Uh, let me tell you a quick story as we, uh, we start to talk about this. We're, we're, by the way, we're in a series called Tough Stuff. You probably figured that out. But the series is uh, intended to uh, purposely talk about the tough subjects that are um, kind of going on in society today, some of the things that are kind of controversial. And so we're intentionally hitting on those things, not wanting to shy away from them, but instead looking at what God's Word has to say about those things instead of, uh, you know, forming our opinions by something else. Amen? Makes sense? So uh, what, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks is same-sex marriage, and, uh, and we kind of talked specifically about that last weekend, and this week we're going to talk more about marriage itself. Uh, I read about a couple who was on their honeymoon, and the, the husband wasn't quite sure how he was going to tell his wife about a real problem that he had, and that's that he had incredibly stinky feet, and, uh, and his socks were just awful, and he wasn't sure how he was going to tell her about that. At the same time, she was on the honeymoon with him, wondering how she was going to tell him about her horrible breath, that she could never get under control. She had halitosis so bad, and so he was praying about this while he's in the bathroom, trying to figure out what he was going to do about it, how he was going to tell her about his feet, and after some soul searching he goes to her and and uh, he says I've got something really important that I need to tell you and she draws up close to him and she says anything you can tell me anything right in his face and he backs up and recoils from her breath and he says wait a minute wait a minute you've eaten my socks <laughs> there's a great uh, controversy in marriage today and that's not it uh, so uh, as we talk about this, we're going to jump right into it because I think it's super important. We've, we've really been handling two questions, and we're on the second one today, and that is, what does God's Word say about marriage? What does God's Word say about marriage? The first thing that I would say about that is, a lot. God's Word says a lot about marriage. God invented marriage. He's the one that put it together to begin with. That's something that we need to really understand. So let me ask you a question as we start to talk about this. Who has the privilege, the responsibility, the right to determine what marriage is? Who, who is it that has that uh, responsibility? Who is it that ought to be able to tell us what marriage is? Who has the right to define marriage? Well, one of the things that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks is that when the Creator, when the Creator is eliminated from the equation, everything falls apart. Everything begins to fall apart. And practically everything becomes confused when we eliminate the Creator from the equation. And I think marriage is a prime, prime example of this. Uh, who defines marriage, the creator or the creature? Who defines marriage, the creator or the creature? I think when the creature defines marriage, anything goes. And, and I think that just makes sense. Uh, where do you get your definition as the creature, right? I mean, I'm the created. Anybody see that? So where do I get my definition for things? I've got to make that up. I've got to create that myself when I fail to look to the creator for that definition. There's no basis. There's no ground rules. There's no foundation. As we talk about that today, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about as we finish up is how, where does that go when you follow that rabbit trail? When you start to define everything yourself, where does that end up? How many of you see that as a little bit terrifying? Anybody? I mean, think about where that goes if I get to define everything. Who gets to define marriage? Uh, I would ask you to take a look at a couple of passages of Scripture to start with um, as we talk about who gets to define this. Uh, notice these two passages of Scripture. The first one is this, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 3. Now, what's happening here is John, in the Gospel of John, is telling us who Jesus is. 
He's telling us who Jesus is. And so look at John chapter 1 and verse 3, speaking about Jesus. Are you with me? Speaking about Jesus, here's what he says. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So you see what John is saying there is that there, there's nothing in all of the universe that was not created by the word of Jesus himself. Nothing. There's nothing you can think of that Jesus did not personally create. That's who he is. And I like the way Paul uh, develops this a little bit in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Take a look at it with me. It says uh, here, for by him, and he's speaking about Jesus there. You can look at the context if you doubt me on that. But uh, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Now watch this, visible and invisible. So he takes this a step farther in our minds and helps us to understand that it's not only the things that we can see that Jesus created, but also the things that we can't even see he created. I was just recently reading that, uh, you know, in, in my day, uh, you know, over 100 years ago, in my day, uh, they believed, we believed that the atom was the smallest thing that we would ever find. It was the building block of the, of the universe. That was the smallest component. And most recently now, they've determined that there are, are things, fundamental building blocks called quarks and leptons. But the fact is, and those are very small, but the fact is that we may continue to find things that are smaller and smaller and smaller than that because we as human beings are finding what God already has done. In the material world, we think about this and we think, well, you know, God has made everything. Jesus made everything, even down to the quarks and the leptons now. We know Jesus made every last one of those tiny particles that we can't even see. In the immaterial world, though, think about this. So what about the things that are immaterial? Well, he created feelings. He created thoughts. Jesus created those things. All of those immaterial things. In fact, Jesus created and instituted uh, what we would call godly ordinances. Things that we do as believers in Jesus Christ that don't save us, but we do them because we're saved. He created those things as well, and those things are not things we can see or touch, but they're things we do, and one of those things is Christ-centered marriage. Somebody hear what I'm saying? Christ-centered marriage. Jesus was the creator of marriage. There is no such thing as a marriage, according to Jesus, apart from Christ being in the center of that. He created it when he created people. So even if you can't see it, even if you can't touch it, Jesus created it. And so it's really pertinent to us, I think, that Jesus was asked about marriage. In fact, he was asked a, a tough question about marriage, and he, uh, he answered that question with some detail. And so here's what I want you to do. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 19 and verses 3 to 6. Matthew 19, verses 3 to 6. Open your Bibles there if you would. Here's where we're going to park for a minute. Um, Matthew 19 and verses 3 to 6. And here's what happens. Pharisees, those are some conservative leaders in the church who are really against Jesus, came up and tested him by asking a question. Here's the question they ask. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. There's some detail there. Probably more than that Pharisee bargained for. 
There's some real detail there. Once again, what's going on, let me remind you what's happening here is the religious leaders are trying to discredit Jesus by asking him an impossible question. So they do this publicly. They get him on a spot where uh, they ask him a question about divorce. And, and the thing about we need to know about this is that at this time in the first century, the, the, the nation of Israel was divided over the question that they asked. And so what they were doing was they were setting Jesus up. No matter what he says, no matter what side he lands on, he's going to divide the people down the middle and half of them are going to be against him. So they're trying to set him up. And it's great because what he does is he goes right to Scripture and he says, you know what, I'm just going to tell the truth. I'm going to go right to God's Word. And I want you to notice then in answering this question, Jesus gives incredibly clear insight into the Creator's definition of marriage. Are you seeing that? The Creator's definition of marriage. So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at... Uh, Marriage according to Jesus, who just happens to be the creator of all things. Marriage according to Jesus. Anybody home here this morning? All right. So I want you to notice what Jesus defines as he talks about this. The first thing that Jesus defines is this. Jesus defines the people in marriage. Very important that we watch and see what Jesus does here. He defines the people in marriage. Look at verse 4. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them, what? Male and female. Who makes up a marriage? People are created male and female. That's where Jesus goes with that answer. It is a male and a female that make up a marriage, according to Jesus. Now note something else in the passage here. Very important. Uh, genders are distinct. They're, and they're meant to be that way. Anybody see that? Men are meant to be men and women are meant to be women. That's what the Word of God says. You go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 where Jesus was, was speaking from. He goes all the way back to the beginning into creation and he says essentially, guess what? I made them male and female, so guess what? Listen, any confusion on that matter is man-made. It's not God-made. It's sin-made, not Jesus-made. Any confusion is on us. God didn't do that. How many of you understand that the world needs men? Amen. The world needs men who are going to stand up and follow Jesus. The world needs men who are going to lead their households because they follow Jesus. The world needs men to be men. We don't need men who become women. Amen. There's plenty of weak men around anyway. How about we stand up and become what we were supposed to be? God created us men. Let's be men. You know what I don't like? I don't like it when I talk to a man like a man and he can't handle it. Amen. He can't stand the truth. Where's your shoulders? Maybe you need some shoulder work. <laughs> you can't even handle it. Some have said that Jesus never mentioned homosexuality. Here's, the, here's their argument. The argument is, well, you know, uh, God must not really have a problem with it because that's all Old Testament stuff. When Jesus came along, he never said anything about it. And first thing I would call to your attention is, yes, he did. He absolutely did. The first thing that Jesus does here is he defines what the marriage relationship is, male and female. Is that not plain? Anybody home? The second thing that I would call your attention to is when he did talk about divorce, he used the word pornea. He said there's one reason that a person might be able to get a divorce. I don't recommend it. God still hates it. But he said there's one reason, and that Greek word is pornea. It, we translate it sexual immorality very often, but essentially what he's doing is, not essentially, but factually what he's doing is he's taking us back to Leviticus chapter 18 to what's called the pornea code, where he literally said, Yep, homosexuality is a sin. So is adultery and a number of other things, but homosexuality is listed there. So Jesus did talk about homosexuality. He said there's a problem here. It's not the way you're made. 
The third thing I would mention is, is this. Did Jesus talk about homosexuality? Guess what? Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you understand at this point, you understand enough to know that Jesus in the Trinity was right there when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed and he was not in disagreement with that. That's who he is. He's, he's not distinct from the God of the Old Testament. Anything that's printed in your Bible is there because Jesus said that needs to be there. Anything. Not just those red words. Jesus defines the people of marriage. That's the first thing we see. Male and female. That's how he discusses marriage to begin with. The second thing I would call your attention to is the priority of marriage. So we have the people in marriage, then we have the priority of marriage. Jesus begins to talk about the priority of marriage. Again, giving more than they ask for, but giving us a great definition of marriage. Look at he says there at verse 5, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. What importance does Jesus give to marriage? Well, a marriage takes place when a man leaves his father and mother in order to hold fast to his wife. Why do we say that uh, marriage is the highest of all human relationships? We say that, and I say that at practically every wedding I do, maybe every wedding I do. I say that because Jesus puts it there. Marriage is the highest of human relationships. Marriage... Here's what I'm talking about. Look at this. Marriage is a higher calling than the child-parent relationship. Anybody hearing me? Amen. See, some of you are going to hate this because you want to raise your kids in such a way that they're more important to you than your husband or your wife is. And you will screw up your kids when you do that. What you're trying to do is suck your love need out of your kids. You're so needy that instead of going to Jesus and burying yourself in him and getting your love need from him so you can really love your kids, you're trying to milk it out of them. You're screwing them up. You're raising needy kids. This gets confused. Husbands and wives need to love each other first. It's Jesus, then her or him, then others. Marriage is a higher calling than the parent-child relationship. Married couples need to prioritize this, and meddling parents need to understand it. Your kids need to see mom and dad as a united front at home. In other words, here's what happens. We see in Ephesians chapter 5 that what we need to do as husbands is love our wives primarily. Wives need to respect their husbands primarily. Those are the two things we need to understand, love and respect. Anybody getting a hold of that? How many of you understand that as a woman, if you're in a marriage relationship or if you intend to be in a marriage relationship, the first thing you need to understand is that you respect that man. But you also need to understand, men, that you're supposed to love that woman as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for her. She's before you. She's before you. Anybody getting that? She's before you. So a man and a wife and Jesus are united as one. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Listen, one of the Ten Commandments, do you understand is honor your father and mother. Amen. Do you hear what Jesus is saying here? The one reason that we step away from that, the one reason that, that, that we separate from mom and dad is for this new relationship that has a higher priority than that one. That's the one reason. We don't fail to respect them now. We don't fail to honor them now. But we honor them in a different way as we form a new family. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? for the greater purpose of marriage. The third thing that Jesus defines is this, the plaster in marriage. 
Jesus defines the plaster in marriage. All right, I feel like I have to explain this again. I, uh, marriage bonds, marriage bonds, B-O-N-D-S, bonds a male and female as husband and wife. Why do I use the word plaster? Because it starts with a P. Okay, I, I admitted it, all right? And I, and I didn't think of it on my own. A guy the other day, he's, he's, he's texting me. I'm on a team with him developing the men's ministry for Kansas and Nebraska. He texts me and he's asking me some questions about the upcoming Man Up Conference. And I answer his questions for him. Then I text him back and I say, okay, I need a word for bond that starts with a P. He texts me back. He says, plaster. I said, man, you're the man. You got it. Okay, I'll use that. He texts me back, and he says, are you doing a crossword puzzle? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sitting in my office. doing. A, I have nothing else to do. <laughs> doing a crossword puzzle. Uh, so anyway, uh, here, here's the deal. This is the plaster, the bond in marriage. Notice what he says. The two shall become one flesh. You seeing that? The two shall become one flesh. And he doesn't stop there. See how important this is? He wants to reaffirm this for us. And he says, verse 6, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. You know, whenever somebody says something twice to you, how how many of you know that they want you to hear that? This is Jesus saying, I want you to understand something here. You're asking me about divorce? Let me tell you what's taking place. The two have become one flesh. The, the titles have changed. The roles have changed. The two become one flesh. Everything changes. This isn't cohabitation where we each have our own lives anymore. That's not what this is. The two become one flesh. That word, uh, phrase, hold fast. Somebody say hold fast. This is one word in the Greek, and the word is the word that's used for cement. Cement. This is, this is a connection that goes far beyond anything physical. See, in, in the physical world, uh, when two things are joined together, there has to be a material that holds them together. You understand that? Two things are joined together that are the same. There must be something between them that connects them in order to hold them together. For example, if I had two pieces of wood up here and I I stood up here and I put those two pieces of wood together and then let go of them, those two pieces of wood would fall apart again. But if I have some epoxy or some wood glue and I put it on both pieces of wood and then I put those two pieces of wood together, what happens? They stay together. I can even drop them and they'll stay together. In fact, when they make beams for your house, it's called composite wood. They put it together with glue and it becomes stronger than wood by itself. We need to understand what it is that Jesus is saying here. He's he's telling us that there has to be uh, not just you and another person, not just a male and a female, but there's got to be someone to bond those two together, and that someone is intended to be the Lord Jesus Christ. God is the cement, and it's a permanent permanent bond and think about this uh, if you've done any kind of carpentry you know this you put that glue on both pieces of wood not just one when you put them together now understand what he's saying here if a husband knows the Lord Jesus and is living his life for the Lord Jesus is dependent on the word of God for his life and the wife is dependent on the word of God for her life. She knows Jesus. She's committed her life to Jesus. There's cement on both those pieces of wood and that marriage can last. Anybody hear what I'm saying? It's a fusing together that's far beyond physical. It's a spiritual fusing together where God is directly involved in that. The two shall be cemented together. 
So the question was asked, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus says, you're missing the point. Jesus is illustrating that when the two become one flesh, the fact is to tear them apart again. If they're bonded that way, think, think, think. Somebody say, I'll think. If they're bonded that way, it's going to destroy us to come back apart. There's going to be destruction in that. There's going to be incredible pain in that. Psalm chapter 63, verse 8, I just love this. My soul clings to you. Anybody hearing me? My soul clings to you. Do you hear what he's saying? The psalmist, it's, it's beyond physical. My soul clings to you. The plaster in marriage. The fourth thing that Jesus defines is the permanency of marriage. The permanency of marriage. Look at verse 6 and notice what he says. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Let not man separate what God has joined together. Man should not attempt to separate those who have become one. Why? Because God has joined them together. See, we took the creator out of it, we made it a man-made institution, and we determined then we can destroy it just like we made it. And that's not what God says. Anybody with me? The word separate there is, is the root word for where we get the word divorce from. We, we didn't make that up. God said don't do it, so we figured out how to do it. <laughs> Zugos is the word for hath, uh, has joined together, has joined together. The word zugos is the Greek word for that. And, uh, and, a, and a better translation would be uh, he has yoked them, yoked them together. Do you know what a yoke is besides the middle of an egg? You know what a yoke is? It's a wooden thing that connects two oxen together. So when you're plowing a field, you have this giant harness that goes, this wooden harness that goes over the backs of the oxen, and then this loop that comes up and connects that yoke to the, to the neck of the oxen so that there's one oxen connected to the other one, and there's no way that one oxen can go this way and the other one can go that way because they're yoked together. And so what Jesus is saying here is that God has joined them, yoked them together. It's, there's a really important symbolism here. In fact, I want to tell you, in ages past, when marriages took place, they would take, during the ceremony, they would take that yoke and they would put it on the, husband, the new husband and wife. And all through the wedding and the ceremony, they would literally be yoked together so that people would see that symbolism, so that they would feel that symbolism, so that the, the, the picture is this. Uh, the husband goes that direction, the wife has to go that direction. There, there's no separation in where they're going. The goals are the same. The, 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 the purpose is the same. I'm, I'm moving forward in my relationship with Jesus. We're both doing this. We're on the same page. We're going the same direction. We're plowing the same field. It's worth mentioning that the very same language, that yoke language, is used at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 where it commands us, listen, somebody say I'm listening, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What he's telling us is this, and many of us have made this mistake, we don't need to make it again, it's the mistake of, of, of God's lasting recipe for a Christ-centered marriage is that each of us have that cement. Each of us are, we're yoked together with Christ, so we're moving the same direction. An unbeliever and a believer being yoked together simply doesn't work for Christ-centered marriage. The goals aren't the same. The purpose isn't the same. Anybody hear me? Both need to be committed to Jesus and obedience to his word. Shante Fieldhan is a Harvard-trained social researcher, popular speaker, best-selling author, and 
Here's, I want to give you a little bit of research that she has been working on. Here's what she found. Active, conservative Protestants who attend church regularly, listen, are actually 35% less likely to divorce than those who have no religious preferences. So again, if they're active in their faith, active in their church, they're 35% less likely to divorce than those who have no religious preference. So you notice the element of active commitment. Anybody seeing that? Active commitment to Christ. Now, if that doesn't impact you enough, I want you to hear this other statistic. This is amazing. What we would call nominal Christians... um, that is, those who would call themselves Christian but don't actively engage in the faith. That would be church, prayer, Bible study. Don't actively engage in the faith. Or actually, listen now, 20% more likely than the general population to get a divorce. Did you get that? 20% more likely than the general population. I don't know, I've been saying it for years, but it sounds like to me what's going on there is this. There's a link between just putting on a religious show and blowing it. Anybody hear me? I mean, listen, if you're just fooling around with Jesus today, you think you're doing something by showing up to church. You just got this like Sunday commitment to Jesus. You don't really even care about his word too much. You're going to walk out the door and do your thing anyway. Uh, it's not just marriage that won't last. You won't either. <laughs> You're fake. So, it, 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 you know, it's been said that marriage is under attack. And it sure is. I mean, it, it's under attack in the world and, and in our society for sure. But I think in most cases we've really kind of let down our defenses and we've allowed that attack to happen. How many of you understand there's a lot of reasons that people don't have faith in marriage? Yeah? Uh, In in a lot of cases, we've given them the reason to not have faith in marriage. (laughs) Uh, Let let me call your attention to Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let's just stop right there for a minute. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Here's what he's saying. Marriage should be held in the highest regard. Marriage is defined in God's word as one man and one woman for life. And so that's what he's talking about. That should be held in the highest regard in our society. And obviously, when it's not held in the highest regard in our society, things begin to fall apart. The world begins to fall apart. Our society begins to fall apart. It should be esteemed, and when it's not, things fall apart. Sort of. Can I be honest? Is that all right with you guys? I mean, it's going to suck, but you're okay with that for a minute? I mean, see, the second part of the verse is, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. See, what he's saying there is that... uh, Marriage is not honored among individual married couples sometimes and, and, and often. And, and when it's not, then society doesn't honor marriage. Do you hear what he's saying? Because it doesn't happen within the marriage like it's supposed to. The marriage bed is not undefiled. Then society doesn't honor marriage either. We didn't honor it in marriage, and so it's not honored by society. It falls apart. And it falls apart what? One family, one marriage at a time. Anybody hearing me? People have to be true and faithful in marriage. I I heard a comedian say when I was studying for this over the months, I heard a comedian say, no wonder gay marriage is gaining such popularity. After all, traditional marriage works less than half the time. It's true. He's right. So, here's what I want to point out to you and try to help us to understand. What happens in society is, and listen close. Somebody say, I'm listening. 
what happens in society is traditional marriage fails because people are selfish and self-centered. Are you understanding that? It's not irreconcilable differences. It's not he did this to me or she did this to me. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's not that at all. The fact is traditional marriage fails because people are selfish and self-centered. That's a fact. Sin, at its very core, every kind of sin, has one thing in common. It's selfish. It's about me. <sighs> Marriage and divorce is no different. It, it, we, we forgot, guys, we, we forgot that one of God's great purposes in marriage. Now hear me well because people miss this. People miss this. We forgot that one of God's great purposes in marriage was to beat me down, to shape me, to, to cut off my rough edges, to sand away at me, and to use that other person to do it. You know what a helpmate is? That's God's definition for your mate. You know what that person does? That's God's active pursuit of you in a marriage. That's the sanctification process in marriage. You get that? Anybody? Amen. And we think that that other person is there to make us happy. That's not even it. That's not even close. That's, there's nothing in God's word like that. For us to be shaped in marriage, that requires a softness and not a hardness of heart. Listen to me. Do you, ha do you have any idea how often you need to be praying for a soft heart? How many of you understand that your heart is just naturally hard? And then there's everything around you that just makes it harder and harder and harder. You need to be asking God for a soft heart. Not a bunch he can do with you if your heart is hard. And we forget, you know, our, our, our biblical roles. Think about this for a minute. We, we forget our biblical roles as husband and wife or men and women. We, we forget that God created us to be what we are and to really fulfill that role in society. And so what happens is boys grow up with a masculine controlling mother and weak effeminate fathers who don't engage and lead in the home who don't know the Word of God, who don't take it to their kids and help them to understand it. And children grow up sexually confused. And they seek to escape. Families are ruined, kids are damaged, and, the, and you know what kids say? Here's what they say. They say, you know what, I don't want what mom and dad had. I'm going to look for something else. Doesn't that just follow suit? Isn't that where we're going when we define it? And this is a generational failure. I want you to understand that. According to Exodus chapter 38, this is, this is a, a generational failure. One generation does it, and the ripples in the water go, and the next generation does it, and it does it, and it does it, and you've seen it in your family, haven't you? Anybody? Amen. And if somebody doesn't stand in the gap and stop that ripple, then it keeps happening after you too. Who gets to define it for you? You can be the person who continues that ripple or you stop it. I think we can change this deal. I really do. I really believe that we can change this. We can do something about it. We can. We, we can hold marriage in high regard, in high honor as Jesus defines it. We can hold it in great honor. And, and we can be honest. Do you, do you understand how important this is? We can be honest with our kids about our failures and our need for forgiveness. And we can model that to them. Not making excuses for our failure, but saying, you know what? 
I'm giving my life to Jesus now, and I'd really like for you to do that too. And I'm willing to prove it. That's fine. I'm not asking you to say that I'm different today. What I'm asking for is you to watch Jesus do this in me, and it's going to be different, but it's going to take some time. I, we can commit our lives. We can commit our relationships to Jesus Christ. We can lay down our lives and give him our lives, and we can make a difference. i got to tell you something. I, I, in finishing this up, I couldn't get away from Matthew chapter 7. And, and so I'd love for you, if you have your Bible again, please turn to Matthew 7. And verse 24, and this isn't going to be on the screen because I want you to get this right from what God says. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Here's what Jesus says, and, and we're going to go slow for a minute because I want you to really understand what he says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does, not, uh, and does them, excuse me, I'm going to do it again because I don't want to blow it for Jesus here. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Watch. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Well, there's plenty of people sitting in church this morning, not just here, everywhere, and they're hearing what Jesus says. The big question is, do I leave here and do it? Hearing it doesn't even matter. How many of you understand that there's plenty of people who are going to hear the word of God and go to hell? It's what you do with it that matters. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now watch, verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. Because that's what happens. Right? Your household... You, your house, you, you get pounded. The world pounds you. Satan pounds you. It all comes at you. It wants to destroy you. It beats on you. It, 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 it tempts you. It tries to drag you away. It's all over you all the time. But look at what he says. This person who heard my word did what I said is like the man who built his house on the rock. And when that happened, when that rain fell, when those floods came, when the winds blew and beat on that house, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Now, you can't study Jesus without getting a warning. And anytime you go any place and all you hear is the good pretty stuff, leave that place and come back here. Verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. Did you get it? Does not do them. Will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell the floods came, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. We are either contributors to what 
society says, buying into it, accepting it, trying to be part of it, or we live by the Word of God. There's no middle ground. There's one or the other, and there's going to be conflict in following Jesus. It's not going to please everybody. Do you understand? We talked about this for two weeks because it's so important. Do you understand what it means to follow Jesus today? Do, do you understand that, uh, that when, when we hear God's word, here's what has to happen. Listen close, listen close. When we hear God's word, here's what has to happen. I don't, I'm, when I hear God's word, I have to adjust my life every time to what I've just heard. Every time. See, I'm a fallen human being. I'm a screwed up human being. I am messed up at the core. I'm mostly sin. I'm mostly flesh. The fact is, when I hear God's word, I've got to make an adjustment to follow him. So when I say something like, I'm following Jesus, huh? Yeah, until you hear God's word, then you've got a choice to make again. Do you keep following him? Because that means you make an adjustment to follow him. It doesn't mean... Yeah, I'm still saying I'm following him. No. It means you make an adjustment. And that means your walk looks different after you leave this place than it did when you came in. If you can't find something in God's word today that says you need to change your walk, something's wrong. Is that true? That's the truth. We're talking about the very words of God. Obviously, I'm going to have to adjust my life. Father God, we thank you for your word, Lord, and even when it's kind of tough, which seems like that's all it is here lately. But Father God, we know that uh, there's opportunity in it too, amazing opportunity to be encouraged and to adjust our walk to you. Father, perhaps there would be some people here today who would recognize uh, that, would, that would see without a doubt, you know, um, that there needs to be an adjustment today. Maybe that adjustment is at its very core that what I've really done is said that I believe instead of doing belief. Would you, w- w- would you cry out to God today? Would you cry out to God to, for mercy recognizing, saying, you know what, God, I am a sinner separated from you by my sin. I am. It's the truth. That's the truth. I'm calling it what it is. But today I repent, and repent means to turn from that sin and to turn to Jesus. I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. I know you gave your life on the cross to pay for my sin. And so I know I can be forgiven as I give myself to you. What that means is not a moment decision today, but a lifetime decision. That means that from this moment on, my life belongs to Jesus. God, I'm anxious to see what you're going to do with my life as I give it to you. I'm not a fool. I don't want to build my world on the sand. I want to build it on the rock of Jesus Christ. I want to be that wise man who comes to you with everything. I recognize, God, that the moment that I walk out of here, maybe even yet as I'm still in here, that there's going to be challenges to what I've just said. I want to follow you, and immediately the challenges come. And I have to make a decision all the way through this day about what I'm building my house on. God, give me the strength to continue to give my life to you, each and every choice. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.